Between now and 2030, Mercedes is promising an onslaught of full electric vehicles and a huge percentage of their sales worldwide transitioning to electric. Arguably the first of this transition is the new 2022 Mercedes-Benz EQS. This is the S-Class of EVs. This is by no means Mercedes-Benz first EV, but up until now, all their EVs have been converted ICE platforms, and this is built on Mercedes' all-new electric platform that we're also going to see underpinning the new EQE coming next year. To be ultra-specific, I should say that the EQS is the S-Class of EVs, not an EV S-Class, because the S-Class recently got a complete redesign and it shares literally nothing with the EQS other than some mild electronic systems on the inside. The platform for this is completely different and completely dedicated to electrification. So perhaps a better way to think of the EQS is as S-Class reimagined. According to Mercedes, the new EQS is the most aerodynamic production vehicle in the world, and it certainly looks the part. You'll notice that the front end is very rounded off and very low to the ground. The hood height is much lower than the S-Class for this generation. Even though we have sort of an homage to a grill up front, the only actual openings are down here below, and we do have active grill shutters. Because the EQS was not designed for one of Mercedes' twin-turbo V8s or one of their twin-turbo V12s under the hood, we have a much shorter hood and more of a cab board profile than we've seen in any modern Mercedes. This actually reminds me in terms in terms of its profile, a little bit of perhaps 1990s Chrysler LH products. The hood wraps all the way around here and becomes part of the front fender in order to help improve aerodynamics. And you'll notice that the EQS badge, the only one you'll find on the side is right here in this little glass area that's in the lee of all this styling aerodynamically so it doesn't exact the toll. In case you're wondering, since you can't open the hood, you can't clean the area right there under the windshield wipers very easily. That is one flaw that I noticed. I live out in a forest, lots of leaves around here, that's a problem. But if you want to fill the windshield washer fluid, it's behind this little door right here on the driver's side. This particular model is the EQS 580, so we have 21-inch wheels. Very unique styling there on the wheel. You'll notice that the wheelbase of the EQS is pretty similar to the Mercedes-Benz S500. But at 207.3 inches long in America, this is actually a little bit on the short side for a full-size European luxury sedan in the United States. Now in Europe, there are shorter versions of the BMW 7 Series and the Mercedes-Benz S-Class, but in the US, we only get long and extra long on the S-Class side. If you want the longest version of the S-Class, it's going to be considerably longer than the EQS. Now Mercedes has caused a little bit of confusion because at times they have called this a sedan, and at times they've called it a liftback or a sportback. You'll notice it is definitely a liftback versus the S-Class that dramatically improves cargo space and cargo practicality. The cargo area on the spec sheet is a little bit less than twice the size of the one in the S-Class, but I think this is at least twice as practical. As we see in a decent number of EVs, the greenhouse really curves in and pinches as we go to the rear to give us not only a strong hip shape right back here, but also improve aerodynamics as things go to the back. Aerodynamics are incredibly important for any electric vehicle because in terms of onboard energy storage, this has about the same amount of energy on board as a BMW a BMW motorcycle. And that's why we have all the rounded shapes that we find on the EQS. The upside is that the rounded shapes also make this really easy to wash yourself at home. No weird treatments down here at the bottom of the bumper, no big fins or anything like that. And everything is basically on the same plane. That really helps the air flow over the vehicle very cleanly, very smoothly, and reduce drag. We have the EQS 580 logo right there, formatic, because this is a dual motor vehicle. The tail lights are full LED modules, the turn signal is an amber element, but when it's off everything is red tinted to give it a more cohesive look. In North America, the base EQS makes do with a single electric motor in the rear that produces 329 horsepower and 406 pound-feet of torque. If you want more power and all-wheel drive, you have to step up to the 580 that gives you another electric motor up front and a total of 516 horsepower and 611 pound-feet of torque. Now in case you're wondering, the hood does not open even in the base model that doesn't have the second electric motor up front. That's because of the way Mercedes decided to design this platform with the location of the air conditioning, the steering rack, and everything that's going on in the front of the vehicle. Logically, they could have given us a little bit of extra storage space there, but it may have impacted the aerodynamic profile of this vehicle and therefore its range, which is pretty darn healthy. 350 miles of range if you get the rear wheel drive model, 340 if you get the all wheel drive model. The surprisingly high range figures are due as much to the aerodynamic profile of the EQS as to the fact that it has a big battery. Charging happens back here on the passenger side, and there are three different onboard AC chargers depending on where you buy this around the world. In Europe, you have the option of 11 kilowatts or 22 kilowatts because three-phase power and three-phase charging is just a bit more plentiful there. In the United States, most residential situations only have single-phase power, and that's why we really never developed a three-phase charging standard in the United States. So the onboard charger drops down to 9.6 kilowatts. This also supports DC fast charging, of course, and it uses the newer CCS standard. 
If you have access to the right CCS charge station, this will charge at a rate of 207 kilowatts peak and it will sustain about 200 kilowatts for a pretty long time. Thanks to my friends over at Inside EVs, they have a deep dive into the charging rates on this, but the interesting tidbit and takeaway from that test is that this sustains a higher average charge rate than a Tesla Model S. This goes from 20% to 80% at an average of 155 kilowatts, just 130 for the Model S. And honestly, I was really surprised by that because this is gonna be one of the fastest average charging EVs out there. In a five minute session, it may not give you quite as much oomph as you'd find in a Model 3, Model Y, or the refreshed Model S, but over 20 minutes, this is going to give you more charge. If you're the traditional Mercedes-Benz S-Class customer that loves road trips, Mercedes has your back, and they've decided to include three years of unlimited DC fast charging on the Electrify America network with the purchase of any EQS. As you'd expect, front seat comfort is excellent. These aren't exactly the seats that we find in the S-Class, but they're pretty similar, and they offer basically the same kind of feature set. Extending thigh cushion, power inflatable bolsters, available seat massage, four-way adjustable lumbar, an electric adjustable memory-linked headrest, tilt telescopic power steering column, also memory-linked, heating, ventilation, etc., and the front passenger seat and the driver's seat operate in the same way. We even have the option of going into the system here and choosing automatic seat positioning. I can say, I am six feet tall here, start positioning, and it will find what the Germans say is the ideal driving position for me. Oh, a little higher than I would have thought, but still pretty comfortable. As sometimes happens with new Mercedes vehicle launches, I don't have any official rear seat legroom numbers just yet. But for some reason, the front seats don't move quite as far back in their tracks as we find in the Mercedes-Benz S-Class. So if you are a person with really long legs, you may find the S500 a bit more comfortable than the EQS 580. But rear seat passengers have tons of room back here. This front seat's just for me at six feet tall. I've got about a foot of legroom left. Headroom is a little bit more limited than I had expected, but you can thank that sexy aerodynamic profile. If if I lean my head back here to the headrest, my head is definitely digging into the ceiling if I'm trying to lean back like that. Moving all the way over to the right side, this front seat is all the way back in its tracks. Again, keep in mind it doesn't move quite as far back as you'd find in an S-Class, but I still have a solid six or seven inches of legroom left. From this angle, you can really see how my head is digging into the ceiling if I try and put my head back like that. Rear seat passengers get a padded center armrest with cup holders four zone automatic climate control in the trim that I'm driving. We also have 40, 20, 40 folding rear seat backs. Now keep in mind that the EQS is somehow less expensive than the least expensive S-Class in the United States. And I'd honestly expected the EQS to be more expensive. So clearly Mercedes has done a little bit of calculations about which features to include and which features not to include in order to keep the price tag as low as it is, which is still nearly $110,000 starting. Now the other thing you're gonna notice back here is the width of the rear seat area. It actually is narrower than the front, that boat sort of like profile that I showed you earlier. It's really obvious back here where things curve in and sitting back here in the rear seat, the side of the vehicle is a lot closer to my shoulder than it is if I'm sitting up front. For me at least, one big reason to buy this over the S-Class sedan is the cargo area. It is absolutely enormous. For some reason in this generation of S-Class, the trunk area has shrunk and it's now just below 13 cubic feet. So not too far off where we see the Mercedes-Benz C-Class to be honest, but this has an enormous cargo area. It's approximately 22 cubic feet when calculated the way that most European companies do where it's below the headrests. But of course you have all this area available up here. If I pull off this little cargo cover and then roll it right back up, you could stack cargo right up to the top. You could also fold the seats down. This is the S-Class that you could put a barbecue in from Home Depot and carry it home no problem. There's also some additional storage space right here onto the load floor, but this is mainly where Mercedes has decided to put the charge cable. I have to admit, I'm a little bit surprised that Mercedes has just included a very basic level one EVSE with the EQS. I would have hoped that they would have given us at least a 30 amp or so level two EVSE that you could travel with. Until Audi decides to give us an A7 e-tron, this is gonna be one of the most cargo practical EVs in the luxury segment. Let's start the interior tour on the passenger side because if I leave the passenger seat, the screen is going to default to a selection of home screens. In this vehicle right now, it's gonna be a compass rose. You'll see that in a bit. One thing that I noticed about this system is that we still don't have Apple CarPlay over here on the passenger side. I really wish that someone would implement that because according to Apple, they do support multiple screens. But aside from that one little omission, this is quite simply the best and most useful passenger screen I've ever seen. This is considerably more useful than the one in the Taycan. Not only is it really snappy in terms of its responsiveness, something that I have noticed a problem in the Taycan, but we also have access to everything. If I want to adjust the driver's seat massage, for instance, 
turn on the driver's seat massage for the person up there, uh, adjust the ambient lighting, the seat, etc. All the same functions that we find on the bigger screen in the middle are available on this screen, even the EQ screen there. So we can adjust the charging options, consumption, things like that. Uh, we can go back here and uh, adjust the media interface. The navigation interface gives us turn by turn nav directions and full satellite imagery there. Same sort of pinch to zoom thing going on here that we find in the bigger screen. We even have access to the same sort of integrated apps that we find in the bigger screen, like weather, a web browser built in. The web browser is still a little on the slow side, but it's definitely an improvement over the web browsers that we've found in previous versions of the Mercedes software. The only particular limitation with this screen seems to be that over on vehicle settings, you can't adjust the active safety systems, which makes an awful lot of sense. Going back over to the driver's side, we have different controls and consoles than we find in the rest of the Mercedes lineup with lots of ambient lighting and really unique textures. You can see the adjustable ambient lighting right here behind the section, sort of a knurled look right there. We have a large two pane moonroof, so one large pane right over here over the driver and front passenger's heads, and then a smaller one located right back there for the rear passengers. The shades are operated together, so if the rear passengers want their shade open, the driver and front passenger have to have theirs open as well. We have high adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and front passenger. Pretty thick pillars though right there. Four-way adjustable headrests. Up and down is electric. In and out is this little button right here, and then we get the pillow that we've seen in other Mercedes models. It's a little bit difficult to see in the daytime, but because you can never have too much ambient lighting, they've even thrown an ambient lighting strip right here on the front seat backs between this back portion and then the upholstered front. As you'd expect, the front seats are heated and ventilated, and we have tons of premium materials in here. Looking at the passenger door, you can see that wood strip that goes right down there towards the passenger footwell. Lots of premium materials. Pretty much everything on the door is a soft touch material, either stitched, the upper section right here in the armrest is court, sort of a uh, wetsuit-like material. And then the rest of the door is a soft touch injection molded plastic. This has the up-level audio system. You can see the metal speaker grills right there and the controls for the front seats with the seat memory, heating and ventilation controls. Moving on over to the dashboard, we have that passenger side LCD that you saw earlier. That's a 12.3 inch LCD air vents around there, lots of ambient lighting. And then the dashboard is dominated by this absolutely enormous, nearly 18 inch LCD in the middle. Then over here on the driver's side, we have a 12.3 inch LCD instrument cluster. And you'll see that all three of these displays can be displaying the moving map display with satellite imagery. There's a ton of onboard processing power. We also, of course, have smartphone integration. If I click over here to CarPlay, you notice that CarPlay is really, really big. This is one of the largest implementations of CarPlay ever, but it doesn't occupy the entire screen. It's actually kind of funny, driving around at night with Apple CarPlay engaged in the system, the screen looks an awful lot smaller than if you use the native Mercedes screen right there. The lower portion of the LCD is pretty much always dedicated to system functions like the climate control settings right there, the home button that pops up that home menu. And then to give everything a more cohesive look, all three screens are under one large piece of polycarbonate. So you can see that the dashboard really has an expansive look. It stretches all the way from one side to the other. Lots of ambient lighting going on there wood trim down here. I love the minimalist wood trim, but I like the fact that Mercedes has kept it in this vehicle. We have a Qi wireless charging mat there, six USB charge ports, and they deliver up to 100 watts. So you can actually charge your MacBook or other laptop with those. I'm currently charging a camera using the two charge ports down there. Another interesting touch is in this large cargo area below, we have two charge ports, but the other four ports in the car, these all interface with the system. So you can Apple CarPlay from either of those two ports, your wireless interface, or the two ports that are in the center console. We have two cup holders right there. They are removable. Some controls here for the audio system and the vehicle. You can change drive modes, activate the 360 degree camera, pull up some dedicated menus like the dedicated EQ button right there pulls up that menu. The car button pulls up that menu right there. Start, stop, hazard light button, fingerprint sensor for fingerprint recognition, more of that wetsuit like material right here between the front seats, two more USB ports. And thanks to there not being a transmission right here under the center console, more room in there than we find in pretty much any other Mercedes model. If you want a more classic look to the LCD instrument cluster, don't worry, you can still get that. This display is also used to control the heads up display. We'll take a look at that in a bit, but I have to say, I really like the navigation look there. If we click over to the assistant system, we get a view that is very similar to modern Tesla models, where if you're out on the freeway, it's gonna show you the other cars, the lane lines, the markings, the barriers, etc. Heads up displays are notoriously difficult to film, but this has an absolutely enormous one. If I go back to that settings menu really quick, you can see the extent of the display area there. It is very, very large. And that's because this display doesn't just give you the standard things like speed, the road that you're on, et cetera. It also gives you a turn-by-turn -turn map 
You can see that map right there. Right now I'm on a very boring road, but if I were in a city area, it would actually be showing you blocks and blocks of data, just as you'd see in a vehicle's regular nav system. The steering wheel is quite similar to other Mercedes steering wheel models. We have touch controls on the face. These are not quite my favorite, but they are definitely more reliable than some other manufacturers' touch controls. Controls for the adaptive cruise control system is over there on the left, and the controls for the infotainment system mainly over here on the right. We still don't have dedicated track forward backward buttons, however, something that I really wish Mercedes would address. On the back of the steering wheel, we have regen paddles. I love, love, love the fact that Mercedes allows us to adjust the regen braking this way. We basically have three different levels. Normal recuperation right there, increased recuperation by pulling that down paddle right over there, and then I can pull the paddle on the right to give us no regen braking at all. That's basically coasting. We have a pretty small slim center airbag there, and the steering wheel is leather wrapped matching the upholstery with sort of a split bottom spoke at the bottom. Now let's get the EQS out on the road. Unlike some EVs out there, we do have to press the start button, then we wait and we put it in drive. Starts very much like a normal Mercedes. Some people seem to be offended by that, Personally, it doesn't matter to me at all whether you have to hop in the seat and hit drive or not. Now, if you do forget to turn the vehicle off when you leave, it will eventually go to sleep itself. Once you get the EQS moving, you'll notice that this feels very much like an electric S-Class. The way the ride is tuned, the way it feels out on the road, its presence, etc. It definitely has that solid S-Class feel. Now that we're out on the road, let's talk about the performance numbers. Zero to 60 happened in this model in four seconds flat. This is definitely quick, and the immediacy of the acceleration is probably the first thing you're gonna notice. If we come to a complete stop, I'm not zero to 60 testing, obviously, because we're on a slope and the speed limit here is not 60, but just to give you an idea of the acceleration, it is very instant, very quick, and it gets to 100% power output very rapidly. That's really the key to getting zero to 60 quick in an EV. Electric motors like this can deliver instant power basically from a standstill, but if a manufacturer were to allow the motor to do that, you could end up damaging components like the gears in the vehicle, the transmission. Uh, you could even end up spinning the rubber off the tires because electric motors are capable of that much immediate torque. So every EV manufacturer out there chooses to ramp up torque more gradually than simply a light switch. But it's obvious if I go here and stop again, that the way that Mercedes is ramping the torque is pretty rapid. So this gets about to 100%, right around 15 miles an hour or so. So very, very quickly. And expect that to go to the next level with the AMG product. Even though this is a pretty heavy vehicle, this is 1,200 pounds heavier than the S500. And the S500 is not exactly a lightweight luxury car. But thanks to the 265 with Goodyear tires on all four corners, this managed to stop very quickly, just 122 feet. This is actually a little shorter than something like the Lexus LS500 hybrid, which is considerably lighter. Of course, when the road starts to bend, the laws of physics must be obeyed, and this is simply not going to grip the road as well as certain versions of the S-Class. But unlike certain versions of the S-Class, when the corner is not there and we can romp on the throttle, you'll get much faster acceleration. There's no engine to spool up, there's no transmission to shift. When it comes to the scores, I'm going to give handling a B because obviously there are other large luxury sedans that will grip the road better than this, but this is certainly a lot of fun. When it comes to ride, absolutely an A+. I think Mercedes has done an excellent job making this ride like a big Mercedes sedan. And that may sound odd, but there's a lot of engineering work that goes into that. This is again 1,200 pounds heavier than a Mercedes-Benz S-Class, but they're attempting to damp those suspension motions in a range approximately the same size. This doesn't really have that much different suspension travel than we find in the S-Class. Ground clearance is minorly higher. I believe the suspension travel itself is a little bit larger than the S-Class, but it is truly amazing what they've been able to do with so much curb weight to make this feel like a big, comfortable, luxurious car. It's also very quiet. I measured 70 decibels in the cabin. There's a little bit more road noise than I had expected. I expect the tires on this particular vehicle to be the reason for that, but this is still just about as quiet as any model of the S-Class that I've tested recently and nearly one of the quietest vehicles that we've tested, period, here at Alex Nottos. Now on to the tricky subject of range and fuel economy. Over the week that I've been driving this vehicle, it has been raining and it has been a little bit cooler than average. Mornings in the 40, 45 degree range, evenings in the 50 to 60 degree range. So the heater has been used. But bearing in mind that the Model S and the Lucid Air are the only vehicles really in this category that could compete with this, I'm gonna give fuel economy at the moment a B plus because this is not quite as efficient as that brand new Lucid Air. And Tesla's efficiency is honestly really, really good. If there's one thing that Tesla does very well, it's electric motor and drivetrain efficiency. 
For the range test, I got the EQS battery completely full, started at my office, and basically did loops around San Jose, California. I ended up being able to put 345 miles on the vehicle before the battery indicated zero, and I ended up back at the office. That is truly impressive, especially keeping in mind that the EQS is a big, heavy sedan, and it was using the heater the entire time. On the day that I was driving around the Bay Area, it was about 50 degrees. The heater was on, set to 72 degrees in the cabin. EVs with over 300 miles of real-world range are pretty rare, and even rarer when you consider the fact that this is a big, heavy EV with wide tires on it, lots of luxury gadgets and gizmos. It has no heat pump, which is also surprising because a lot of the other ultra-efficient EVs out there use heat pumps in order to improve efficiency, and this still got over 300 miles of range. Almost 350, really, to be correct. This is EP rated for 340. I got 345. If you treat this gently, don't use the climate control and keep those speeds to 65 miles an hour or below, you could easily go over 350 miles. This is the kind of EV where you would not need to DC fast charge, simply going from San Jose to Los Angeles, maybe you'd have to DC fast charge in Los Angeles, but this is the kind of EV that could very easily make a round trip with just one to two DC fast charge stops. If you're looking for a long range road trip EV and budget is not a problem, this should definitely be on your shopping list. At the moment, the EQS is going to be available in North America in two different versions, the EQS 450 Plus and the EQS 580 Formatic, what Mercedes calls all-wheel drive. The base version, which is that 450 Plus model that starts at $102,310, gets you 0 to 60 in 5.9 seconds and will give you 329 horsepower. The 584 Mac adds a second electric motor to give you better traction and more power, bumps things up to 516 horsepower, 631 pound-feet of torque, and the 0-60 to drops to 4.1 seconds, but it will cost you because that model starts at $119,110. Now there are some extra features that you'll find standard on the 580 that you find optional on the 450 Plus, so the actual cost of the second electric motor is not as large as you might think. Mercedes has a reputation for offering a ton of standalone options on every vehicle that they sell, but that's starting to change. With the EQS and a number of other new Mercedes models for 2022 and 2023, we're going to start to see different trim levels with packaged options rather than a ton of standalone options. In the 580, for instance, we're going to see three different trim levels. Premium is the base version. We then have Exclusive, which is going to be the mid-level trim, and then Pinnacle, the top-end trim. For $122,510, the exclusive trim gives you everything that you find on the base premium trim of the 580, plus massaging front seats, four-zone automatic climate control, the cabin fragrance system, and the cabin ionization system. The exclusive trim is the one that you've been seeing in this video with a few options added on to it as well. The pinnacle trim is the top end trim of the EQS, but it's interestingly enough not actually the pinnacle of the EQS lineup because you can still add some standalone options to the pinnacle trim. It starts at $125,310 and the pinnacle trim is all about the back seats. It adds things like heated and ventilated rear seats, power rear seats, rear side impact airbags, which are not standard on the other trims for some reason, and rear wireless charging along with a number of other slight changes to the center console. Console. If you get carried away with all of the options on your EQS, including features that I have never really seen before in a new vehicle like rear neck warmers, you'll end up at about $142,000. That's still a lot less than a Mercedes-Benz S-Class as far as its top-end version. Now don't worry, if you want even more power, there is going to be an AMG variant, at least one AMG variant of the EQS at some point in the future. Mercedes has not been overly specific about exactly what future AMG models they're going to be offering. And if you're looking for something that's a little bit less expensive and perhaps a little bit smaller, Mercedes has already announced that there's going to be an EQE, which is going to be one step smaller than the EQS. The size of the EQS and the EQE are important to keep in mind because most of the competition I'm going to be talking about next is more direct competition to the EQE than the EQS. First, let's start out with the Porsche. The Porsche Taycan starts at $82,700. That is, of course, the new base version of the Taycan. If you get carried away with options, you can easily get it up to over $190,000. In fact, the Turbo S Cross Turismo starts at $187,600. The important thing to remember about the Taycan is that it's just not the same thing as an EQS, aside from the fact that they both run on electricity. The Taycan is considerably smaller. It's available as a sedan or as basically a wagon. They call that the Cross Turismo. The Taycan is more focused on handling, on-road driving dynamics. It's incredible performance. The Taycan is an absolute blast to drive. 
even though the Taycan is impeccably built and its price tag definitely is within the pricing lineup of the EQS, it's important to remember that it is absolutely not the same kind of vehicle. On the inside, the Taycan is actually a little bit closer to the Model 3 in terms of its interior dimensions. It's a bit more compact sedan sized on the inside, whereas the EQS is quite large. It is a full-size luxury sedan. It may not be quite as large as the S-Class inside or the 7 Series or the Audi A8, but it is definitely in that same vein outside and on the inside. And the Taycan on the inside, it's definitely fairly compact. On the outside, due to the styling, it may sort of end up BMW 5 Series size, depending on exactly the model that you're looking at. But on the inside, it is definitely about as spacious as a BMW 3 Series or a Model 3. Aside from the fact that both of these vehicles run on electricity, they could not be more different. The Taycan is definitely much more focused at performance, both in terms of handling, acceleration, braking ability, the general feel of the vehicle, etc. It's definitely a sports sedan or a sports wagon, depending on the version that you get. Porsche was really interested in fast 0-60 to 60 performance, repeatable performance, track performance, etc. And that's not really what Mercedes was going for. Mercedes was really trying to create an S-Class for the 21st century. So it really just depends on exactly what you're looking for in an EV. If you're looking for balls out performance, that's going to be the Taycan. If you're looking for the most luxurious and most opulent EV, that's going to be the EQS. Now let's tackle the Tesla Model S. The important thing to remember about the Tesla is that it is a mid-sized luxury sedan, not a full-size luxury sedan. And that means that it is a step smaller than the EQS. On the inside and on the outside, the Model S is about the same size as a 5 Series or an E-Class, making it much more of a direct competitor to the upcoming EQE than the EQS that we're driving in this video. The price tag is also more similar to the mid-size luxury segment as well. It starts at $88,740, so more logically, when the EQE comes out, that's going to be the direct competitor. Although you can get the Model S up into the price range of a full-size luxury sedan by checking that plaid option box that will get you up to $122,740, the price tag doesn't suddenly transform it into a full-size luxury sedan. Just like Getting the E63 AMG version of the E-Class does not suddenly translate it into a full-size luxury sedan, even though it ends up in a similar price range. That size difference is definitely important to keep in mind, because the EQS feels much more roomy on the inside. It also feels more premium. The materials quality, the things that you find on the inside, it feels more opulent, more luxurious, more comfortable, etc., as you would expect in a category that's more expensive. What about that Plaid model? Well, quite simply, that's designed for the person that's interested in quick 0-60 to 60 runs. If you want to go 0-60 to 60 in under 2 seconds, that's going to be the EV for you. At the moment, this is one of the fastest vehicles on the planet. Just remember, it's not exactly the same thing as the EQS, and neither is the new Lucid Air. The Lucid Air has a price range that is pretty similar to the Tesla Model S. It does get more expensive if you take a look at the very top-end trims, but the Lucid Air is still a mid-size sedan. If you're looking for one of the most efficient EVs available in the United States and you're looking for one of the longest range EVs in the United States, you should definitely take a look at the Lucid Air. The Air is manufactured by a startup company called Lucid and that does have some pros and cons. If you're looking for something that's a little bit unusual, off the beaten path, definitely take a look at the Lucid. If you're looking for an EV from a stable company that has made other cars before and there's really no fear about bankruptcy, you might want to take a look at the Mercedes or honestly the Tesla as well. Because even though Tesla has not exactly made too much money here and there, they've proven that they're definitely a going concern. And that is one obvious problem with the Lucid. We just don't know what the future of Lucid is at the moment. So if you're concerned about that at all, you might want to take a look at one of the other two options. But if you're looking for one of the most efficient EVs, definitely one of the coolest looking EVs I I have to say, one of the longest range EVs out there, that would certainly be the Lucid Air at the moment. But as far as competition to the EQS goes, in my mind, there really is only one direct competitor at the moment, and that would be the Mercedes-Benz S-Class. At the moment, the S-Class starts at $109,800. That would be for the base six-cylinder version, so it is a little bit more expensive than the EQS, and honestly, that surprised me. I'd expect the price tags to be a lot closer together, or the EQS to actually be a little bit more than the S-Class, because with the tax credit, it could come down to about the same price tag. But that's not how Mercedes chose to do things. They also chose not to make the vehicles look too similar. So the exterior design of the EQS and the S-Class, it's definitely quite different. The S-Class is a bit more traditional, even though it definitely has a rounded, more aerodynamic design than the previous model. It's certainly more upright and more traditional than the EQS. It's also bigger. The shortest version of the S-Class that's available in the U.S. is going to give you more rear seat headroom and more rear seat legroom than we find in the EQS. A little bit more shoulder room as well just due to the aerodynamic design of the EQS. One of the biggest differences and one of the oddest differences, for me at least, is the lack of the hyperscreen in the S-Class. And honestly, that surprised me. 
if you buy the EQS 580, then the EQS is going to come standard with that massive array of screens that you saw in this video in the dashboard. If you get the S class, even in the top end versions, it's going to have a relatively small display in the middle. Now it's still going to have a separate LCD for the instrument cluster, but the design on the inside and on the outside is much more traditional. And that's one of the reasons that Mercedes said that they chose not to put the hyperscreen in the S class is that there is a certain Mercedes Benz shopper demographic that's interested in something a bit more traditional. That would be the S class sedan, the particular format of the vehicle with a separate trunk, a more classic back seat and an infotainment system that perhaps is a little bit less confusing for some folks than the massive, massive screen real estate that we find in the EQS. Now, for me, at least, that would mean that I would buy the EQS. And I have to say, I have been really, really impressed by the EQS over the week that I had this vehicle. If I were shopping for an EV right now and budget were absolutely no issue, I would buy the EQS over every other EV that's out there right now. It is just incredibly comfortable. I love the enormous screens. I love the build quality and the attention to detail that Mercedes has put into the EQS. Now, there are a few complaints I have. I think that the front end design is a little bit funky. It reminds me a little bit of cab forward Chryslers from early 2000s, but that was because Mercedes was after a very aerodynamic profile. The range is absolutely impressive. I had no problem getting the EPA rating out of the vehicle in my range testing and folks out there recently have been able to get over a hundred miles more out of it. If you treat it really gently and you employ all of your hypermiling techniques, the EQS is incredibly efficient. Be sure to let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section below. And what would you buy if you were shopping for an EV and money were no object? Would you be interested in something like the EQS or would you get something else out there? I have to admit that as much fun as the Taycan is, if I were to live with an EV every day, the EQS is just so much more comfortable that I would be willing to give up the performance and the handling that we find in something like that Porsche for the EQS. And of course, oddly enough, the EQS is going to be a better value than those top end versions of the Taycan because they get pretty darn expensive and the EQS tops out about $30,000 less or so than that top end Taycan. Now that is of course at the moment, and there are going to be AMG versions of the EQS that will take it up to that next tier in terms of price tag. So expect at some point in the future to have a 180, 190, perhaps even $200,000 EQS. But at the moment, the EQS 580 seems like a pretty good deal as far as a full-size luxury sedan goes. Be sure and let me know what you think about that as well down there in the comment section below. Find me at Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all those other social places, and of course, check out the merch store at awaymerch.com, and I'll see all of you later.